Wikipedia editors will no longer use the Anti-Defamation League as a source for entries on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The editors voted to declare the ADL as a, quote, generally unreliable on the conflict, adding it to their list of banned sources. For context, the ADL is a longstanding Jewish advocacy group. According to the Jewish Telegraph Agency, it's also expecting the editors will vote to declare the ADL unreliable on the group's core focus, anti-Semitism. Now, one Wikipedia editor known as Iskander323 wrote, quote, The ADL no longer appears to adhere to a serious mainstream and intellectually cogent definition of anti-Semitism, but has instead given in to the shameless politicization of the very subject that it was originally esteemed for being reliable on. The JTA goes on to list other reasons cited by editors for this ban, quote, a series of controversial statements by ADL CEO Jonathan Greenblatt, whose claimed student protesters were Iranian proxies, compared the Kafea headscarf to the swastika, praised Elon Musk after he promoted a supposedly anti-Semitic post on his social media platform X, and compared anti-Zionism to white supremacy. Responding to the news, the ADL released a statement saying, quote, This is a sad development for research and education, but the ADL will not be daunted in our age-old fight against anti-Semitism and all forms of hate. Many online celebrated the editor's decision. Beyond the Pale host, Raphael Shmunov tweeted, quote, huge and embarrassing for ADL and Jonathan Greenblatt, whose data is so tainted with pro-Israel Hasbro that Wikipedia has democratically and almost unanimously decided to ban it as a source. The Jewish Voice for Peace group in Boston tweeted, quote, the ADL doesn't care about stopping real anti-Semitism. They only want to lie in order to justify Israel's genocide against Palestinians. We must drop the ADL. Thank you, Wikipedia. So I looked into what researchers rely on some of the data that the ADL produces on anti-Semitism. A lot of statistics is what they're putting out. And a professor of Israeli studies at UCLA, Dove Waxman, said they find the ADL data useful to understand the trends in anti-Semitism, but I always have to go deeper into the numbers to see what they're considering. And the Wikipedia editors reportedly have complained that taking the criticism of Israel on its face as anti-Semitic has caused problems. That's why they they find it unreliable. So if the main thing they put out is statistics on anti-Semitism and their definition of anti-Semitism is including what many people don't believe is anti-Semitic and that many Jewish people uh, criticize the state of Israel, that now that, that does make their main output now unusable. Yeah, I have criticized the Anti-Defamation League for a long time. I just looked it up. I wrote an article for Reason about them in 2018 where I looked closely at their statistics on anti-Semitism and they were just like wildly um, uh, conflating a bunch of things. They were inaccurate. They had led, so in uh, in 20, um, in 27, this was a report about anti-Semitism in 2017 and the headline from rep- the report that the media ran with was a 57% spike in anti-Semitic hate. And they attributed that to Donald Trump. So at this time, the ADL was unpopular with the right because they had this whole narrative that anti-Semitism had increased because Trump has emboldened the alt-right, the racist, anti-Jewish um, right-wing people. And so we have all this all this hatred. 57% per, uh, percent spike in anti-Semitic hate. Um, but when you looked more closely at the figure, um, it was, so they were combining a bunch of things. So there's anti-Semitic incidents, and then there's threats, and then there's violence. Mm-hmm. And the incidents category was like, well, that included like schoolyard bullying, that included things that are protected by speech, things that are kind of minor and trivial. Um, they were relying on, uh, you know, anecdotal reports from teachers and students and parents and things. The, the, the more rigorously defined category of anti-Semitic um, hate uh, cr- crimes, threats, was largely due to a single, a, a Israeli teenager who had threatened a bunch, made bomb threats against institutions. He was crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then anti-Semitic vandalism had actually gone down that year. So... It was a mixed, the, the facts were like, okay, you know, some things are worse, some things are better, but the headline that everyone attached themselves to and then made out to stigmatize Trump and the right over was that there was this massive increase and that's what the ADL ran with. You know, this is nothing new for advocacy organizations. I've long criticized and many others on the right and the left have criticized, for instance, the Southern Poverty Law Center says that um, hate 
groups are, you know, they, this, this is this group that has like a map that counts hateful groups in the country. But if you look closely at the map, like, like it's counting neo-Nazi groups. But okay, let's, uh, Arkansas has a neo-Nazi group with six people in it, and then they had a fight, and now there's two neo-Nazi groups with three people in each of them. So neo-Nazi groups have doubled in size in, in that state, according to the way the Southern Poverty Law Center counts it. Not really, this is not serious, this is not threatening. But because it's an advocacy organization that takes in donations by always presenting its problem as worse, it's a little akin to the, to the violent crime we were discussing uh, elsewhere in the show. The advocacy organization, maybe like right-wing media wants you to think the cities are always getting worse under democratic governance, the advocacy organizations want you to think hate is always getting worse um, because we need, we're the ones who track it and monitor it and combat it, so we need more donations. It's an interesting point to talk about the incentives there, Robbie. I think also they want to be like, please care about our issue, it's so big, but by inflating the numbers and lying about it, you're going to lose support in the long term. You might get some donations in the short term, but then when people find out that you're measuring the numbers in a way that many people find to be moot, yeah. then are they going to keep giving you money in the long term? Probably not. This is a common problem, um, but specifically for Wikipedia it's a problem because you have a lot of the editors uh, being people who volunteer. These are not people who are trained to understand statistics and research methodology for empirical research. And so if a UCLA professor uh, has to dig into the data always and see what they're considering, can we trust someone who is a Wikipedia editor without the expertise of a professor to sure. look into the data enough to vet it. The ADL should be putting out statistics that are more easy to understand with qualifiers in the statement. Yeah, so the, the long and short of this is I agree with the Wikipedia editors on this. I find the organization yeah. to be unreliable some of the time. Um, I, I am a, I'm a defender of Wikipedia in general. Mm -hmm. I've defended them on the show many times. Um, uh, in response, once uh, some some people watching like went onto my Wikipedia page and changed it to to demonstrate that like, oh, Robbie trusts everything on Wikipedia. Let's mess with his page. But <laughs> I ended up still being right because because they did that. Editors at Wikipedia shut down changes to the account because they can tell that it's being uh, maliciously edited. And then actually, as a result, they made my biography like more accurate. At, like they they fully mm. fleshed it out. So the and the reason I'm I'm for Wikipedia is is that it's a it's a good kind of fact checking. It's collaborative, consensus driven, community driven. It's actually not you have to be a credentialed expert to contribute here. No, anyone can do it, and then anyone else can say actually you're wrong about this. Here's my evidence, and then another person says well weighs in, and then you see you know who wins in a kind of democratic collaborative market fashion. It's better than deputizing just a small number of fact checkers to decide what's right and wrong, which is what Facebook, for instance, does. It's more like community notes where, again, anyone can say, well, no, this is wrong for this reason, and then we let the community judge what is right. That doesn't mean that the information is always accurate. It just means that over time, I found it to be more likely that bad information gets weeded out. I know it, it's, it certainly has some biases, not saying it's perfect, but to, for my mind, it's better than other um, information fact-checking type systems we've devised online. Yeah, social media and online streaming platforms giving rise to independent journalists, I think has led to the media being more honest because institutions like Brown University, where I went to graduate school, and the New York Times, who published research coming out of the school, they did not do a good job representing the data very well accurately. Mm -hmm. So they published a story saying that, you know, body-worn cameras have no effect on policing behavior study fines, when what really happened is there was not compliance in this study. Mm -hmm. So officers assigned to wear a camera were found to not be turning them on for interactions. There was extremely low footage for the amount of hours these officers were on the job. They admitted mm -hmm. they were not turning the cameras on and would sometimes leave them home if they were assigned to wear one. So can you measure the difference in body-worn camera versus not in the excessive use of force in a, a study? like that, the camera's not being used. You didn't set yourself up to find any result there. That's why there isn't one. But that publication and that headline that ran on the front page of the New York Times really makes it seem like there's no reason we should invest in these cameras that the public really wants because study shows they don't work. That's not what the study shows. And so I think it's a problem not just for advocacy groups, but for all media, including reputable universities like Brown. Indeed. All right, we'll have more rising right after this.